Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books and Political Science, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm Susan Lee Bell at St. Joseph's University, and today I'm joined by Dr. Joanna Wiest to discuss her new book, Born This Way, Science, Citizenship, and Inequality in the American LGBTQ Plus Movement, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2023. Scholars often narrate the legal cases confirming LGBTQ plus rights as a huge success story. While it took 100 years to confirm the rights of Black Americans, it took far less time for courts to recognize marriage and adoption rights or workplace discrimination protections for queer people. The legal and political success of LGBTQ plus advocates often depended upon presenting sexual and gender identities as innate or immutable to fit legal categories. Conservatives who oppose LGBTQ plus equality often argue that sexual and gender identity is something that can be taught. They use the offensive language of grooming and contagious gender ideology that corrupts susceptible children. In Born This Way, Dr. Joanna Wiest unpacks how a biologically based understanding of gender and sexuality, based on arguments from the natural sciences and mental health professions, became central to American LGBTQ plus advocacy. Her book is both a celebratory and cautionary story about the costs of relying on science to win impressive victories for queer rights. The book interrogates the LGBTQ plus rights movement, the scientific study of human difference, and the biopolitical character of citizenship that formed at the nexus of the two. As LGBTQ plus advocates brought science to bear on civil rights struggles, they transformed American politics and the epistemology of identity politics more broadly. Dr. Joanna East is an incoming assistant professor of women's, gender, and sexuality studies at Stony Brook University and a socio-legal scholar specializing in sexual and gender minority rights, health, and political economy. Her book, Born This Way, received an honorable mention from the Society for Social Sciences of Science's 2024 Rachel Carson Prize and was featured on a recent episode of Radio Lab. I am delighted to welcome her to the New Books Network. Thanks so much, Susan. It's great to be here. So let's start with how you came to write this book. Uh, What was it that brought you to the topic? What kind of work and thinking had you been doing that led you to this particular story? Yeah, so this book started, and I think this is probably true of many academics' first books, but it started in a graduate seminar longer ago than I care to admit. Uh, And it was in a class that didn't really have a whole lot to do with queer rights, actually, Uh, but it was a class on the politics and history of something we might call race science. And so really looking at the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and looking at how biologists and physicians, psychiatrists of that period, uh, really used biological tools and instruments and measurements to categorize or taxonomize individuals according to essential categories. And, And those often were racial, there were gendered ones, and there were even early sexual ones too. But these were kind of born this way arguments of a different sort. And that is they justified extremely inegalitarian uh, regimes of social worth and, and, and civic exclusion. Uh, and so that just got me thinking, and this was around the time that Lady Gaga had been campaigning with the born this way kind of anthem uh, uh, for a repeal of don't ask, don't tell, that military exclusionary policy. And just kind of reading these older studies uh, uh, and discourses on race science and then seeing a very similar biological argument being deployed for basically opposite ends got me very curious about just all the different ways that science uh, uh, is kind of shaped by, contributes to political ideologies in these really kind of unpredictable ways. So essentially, I, I wanted to understand how we got to a supposedly kind of liberal, progressive, born this way narrative, at least as it, it, it pertains to LGBTQ people. 
Uh, it's funny, your book was sitting in my living room and uh, my eldest, uh, you know, came to visit and picked it up and said, oh, I, I hate these arguments about born this way. It really upsets me. And I, I said to them, uh, actually, it's not, that's not what the book is about. Like, it's exactly like what you just said is what the book is trying to get at, that even if it was a very successful legal strategy... And I, and I don't think you question that, but that it, as a strategy, it worked, but it had other implications that you're exploring. So, no, it's a great title and, uh, uh, and, and you're very true to all of the words of the title through, throughout the book. And, you know, and it's not uncommon for people to have these ideas in classes that are not directly on what they're studying. So that's a message to the graduate students listening that, you know, take lots and lots of classes and all books take a long time to really get to. The book is divided into two parts. The first part is called Origins and the second part is Evolutions and Adaptations. So let's start with the origins. I mean, why was there what you call a science of civil rights? What, 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 why, where, where did this come from in the history of how queer people have been thought about and how science has been used to define them? Yeah. So back when the first kind of modern uh, gay and lesbian organizations called themselves homophile, at the time were forming around the early 1950s and really taking off in the 1960s. Uh, these organizations were very aware of what the reigning kind of psychiatric understanding of homosexuality was. It was no secret what psychiatrists thought in the early uh, diagnostic and statistical manuals that, that kind of classify these uh, mental disorders. We found homosexuality as, as a kind of mental illness or pathology. And so it was very clear that that idea was shaping the way that uh, queer people were treated, not just in uh, a kind of psychiatrist's clinical office, but also it was informed, that idea was informing all sorts of restrictions uh, on what queer people could do, even in bars that were uh, kind of coded as gay bars. Uh, we'd see lots of police crackdowns and raids on those sorts of dens of so-called deviant sexual behaviors. Um, and queer people, yeah, in general, were, were pathologized during that period. Um, and so these early activists uh, realized from a very kind of early moment in their organizing that it would be useful to make inroads with the reformists that did exist in the science of sexuality at that time. And those are probably, some names are going to be familiar to folks. Alfred Kinsey, uh, the zoologist turned sexologist, uh, was probably the most famous. And, and he and, and folks at the Kinsey Institute were really essential uh, as expert witnesses in early civil rights trials. They also actually came to the defense of the bar owners themselves of establishments that were uh, a kind of... Uh, facing a revocation of their liquor licenses for harboring queer people and other kind of social undesirables like sex workers uh, and the like. Uh, but so, and, and also these early homophile advocates were making inroads with uh, the psychologist Evelyn Hooker in California. And she actually did a really important couple of papers in the 1950s showing that mental illness rates uh, were not different between queer and straight people. So really early on, we're getting Kinsey saying homosexuality is a normal variant of human sexuality would be his quote. Evelyn Hooker saying, by our measurements, these people tend not to exhibit higher rates of mental illness. Uh, and so those sorts of arguments are really useful to challenge that idea that being gay is akin to being sick or, or kind of dangerously unwell. Right. Trying to move away from the pathology and find the people who were, in fact, making arguments for why the science was wrong. So in, in some ways, it almost starts off as a science corrective uh, in, 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 in pushing back on the baseless claims that were being made and therefore these, uh, you know, um, 
uh, diagnoses being offered to to people and and and, and um, branding them. Okay, so there's so there's some early advocates. Um, from from there, how is it that uh, we move towards seeing some of the science as 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 potentially helpful and also ha- harmful? Like how how does it develop from the fifties forward? Yeah, so. I was actually surprised to doing this research to find how many early successes there were uh, among, made by these gay and lesbian uh, advocates and their attorneys when they brought in their Kinsey Institute experts and Evelyn Hooker to testify uh, on behalf of their civil rights. There are some really uh, early Supreme Court uh, of California cases that are very impressive. There's some great uh, early successes in the federal appellate courts as it pertained to restrictions on federal employees uh, who were kind of a huge target of the early Cold War uh, era. Historians will call this the Lavender Scare, and that was the era when the Republican Party, uh, particularly senators, made a lot of kind of headway in attacking uh, the Democratic kind of New Deal uh, regime, then headed up by Truman, no longer FDR, Uh, for harboring not only communists, but queer people in the federal government who were susceptible uh, to Soviet kind of blackmailing. And so all this is kind of downstream uh, from those developments. But at this early period in the 60s, especially, start to see some real cracks in that early sexuality regime in in the law. But what really starts to to really change uh, uh, the kind of pathology narrative is uh, changes made in institutions like the American Psychiatric Association itself. And so that is, we see increasingly uh, gay rights advocates who are becoming more and more professionally organized, building the kind of foundations of the nonprofits like the Human Rights Campaign and the National LGBTQ Task Force that we know today. Those folks are making real inroads at the APA. And they're making inroads with folks who are upset with the reigning uh, old guard in psychiatry for many reasons. So it would be wrong to say that it was uh, queer people convinced uh, challengers to the status quo uh, that they weren't mentally ill. And that's why the American Psychiatric Association in 1973 declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. That's a really lovely tale. That's not exactly what happened. There were those relationships made with folks who uh, were beginning to be kind of more uh, ideologically liberal and and thus seeing that maybe it's wrong to categorize queer people as such. But gay and lesbian organizers also were riding a headwind in so much as there were many challengers to the psychoanalytic old guard, the kind of American Freudians who ran the APA. Uh, And these were folks in the new behavioral cognitive sciences. They had a bone to pick with psychoanalysts in general. And so they found the homosexuality issue as one that was extremely convenient to bat them over the head with. And it really worked. It was an early kind of crack in that old guard's authority. Uh, And uh, in that 1973 change to, to the DSM, uh, And those relationships uh, would become extremely important to queer advocates going forward because they they were increasingly getting their sympathetic allies instantiated in the leadership of organizations like the APA. Uh, One of the things I love about this part of the book and how it's a real corrective for some of the legal scholarship that presents... um, the recognition of queer rights in this like decade period um, between you know the ending with Obergefell and sort of beginning with um, overturning the DOMA and Hawaii and Vermont, as if boom, it just happened. And that one of the things that's really great about the book is the overlay of the multiple strands 
of history that are going on, but also the fact that there is a legal history here. It's happening in certain state courts, but it's also happening at the federal level. So there's a much, much longer period. So it's far so more similar to the struggle for black civil rights in, in how gradual it is and also how the various kinds of allies who are can sometimes be questionable allies, but are nevertheless are on the same side for different reasons, which I think is really important, interesting part about the the APA and psychology and psychiatry. Uh, and this idea that psychiatry creates the problem by putting it in a book that lists pathologies and then is given credit for undoing <laughs> this damage that it has already done um, in the first place. Exactly. Um, and the, the only thing I'll add there is that uh, in the 60s especially, the gay rights, uh, gay and lesbian rights advocates are learning from yes. the fight for black civil rights. They're adopting slogans. Gay is good is kind of uh, uh, an innovation on some civil rights slogans. They're building nonprofit uh, and legal firm organizations that look very similar uh, to the, N- the NAACP, for instance. And so they're very much kind of like in that civil rights lineage. But as you said, at an earlier moment than we tend to talk about. Right. And and look, they are using the playbook. It was a very successful playbook. And if you look at the uh, particularly the road to Brown versus Board of Education, which was laid out, which was thought out by the strategists at the NAACP, the the queer rights aggregates have this in front of them and they can see what worked and this word immutable immutable characteristics is hard baked into the american legal framework of who gets a harder look you know who has to be whose discrimination has to be thought about a little bit harder so i can discriminate in the basis of age i can say that five-year-olds are going to go to this schoolyard and 12th graders are going to go to this schoolyard, but I can't separate people on the basis of race because I have to think about this. So, so there, you know, it's, it's a, no, it's important. They're studying what has been done and what has worked and adapting it. Um, Okay. So this idea of born this way, uh, which sort of starts out as pathologizing and is now being sort of embraced as uh, a tool for, uh, getting rights, how how does this biology and dependence on science play this role in the civil rights litigation that's going on in this period? Right. So we can think about this in a few different ways. Legally, as you mentioned, this idea of immutability is an extremely powerful word, particularly in jurisprudence uh, of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. It's one of the things that uh, if you can demonstrate that your particular category is immutable, then you have a kind of access at least to a route for heightened judicial scrutiny, which is another jargony way of saying that when laws are premised on being uh, categorized as queer or gay, or uh, for instance, uh, then the courts are going to look at them more uh, uh, suspectly. They're going to say, uh, maybe there's actually something that's a violation of someone's fundamental civil rights here that we need to step in and, and quash. And gay and lesbian rights organizers are really going to see immutability as something to pursue after the court, uh, the Supreme Court of the U.S., that is, in 1973, issues this ruling in Frontier of e. Richardson. It's an early gender equality decision, but it really says that we can't discriminate against cis women. Uh, they didn't say cis, but cis women because of um, the kind of immutable characteristic of being born into the female sex uh, would be the logic there. And so then gay rights litigators understand that achieving immutability is going to be really important to getting those heightened protections. They're also using uh, scientific arguments to pursue many different other avenues, but immutability is going to be one uh, where we really see strong assertions uh, that start to look like born this way. Uh, that is, being gay is is solely something about uh, what happens at your birth. 
And I'll just interrupt you for a second, just to fill in some of the people look. So in the Constitution, the 14th Amendment is very clear about race. So that race is a category that has to be looked at. That is written out. But it doesn't say sex. This would have been something that suffragists at the time would have liked, but it wasn't there. And so it, it is in Frontero in which the court begins to expand how it thinks about the 14th Amendment. And it doesn't offer and never has offered still the same scrutiny to either queer people or cis women that it affords to people of a different race because that word is not there. So this is sort of, you know, again, um, sidelined for the people who listen to the show a lot. You know, this is fits into the war about originalism and the rest. But just to make clear, queer people don't have strict scrutiny. They don't get the hard look. They get a softer look called heightened scrutiny along with cis women. Or all women, right. really, I think, actually, with the category. would, And I don't know how they would define it. We'll set that aside. Anyway, I interrupted you. So, uh, so please, like, pick up the no, story. No, that's right. I'm, I'm glad you said all of that because you know, the foreshadowing point here, as you alluded to, is that there is no uh, constitutional kind of text about queer people, right? There's nothing in the Constitution that indicates uh, that queer people deserve civil rights at all. Uh, and the uh, federal government, Congress, and the presidency have failed to pass uh, something akin to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for queer people. The current version uh, that has passed the House is called the Equality Act. And so that just means that like, this fight to achieve strict scrutiny protections is something we still see through today uh, because that judicial route seems like uh, maybe that's still the most uh, uh, likely way that you're going to get that level of protection. But it's, 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 uh, it's a sad fact that we, we go all the way back here to the 1970s and we see these gay rights litigators say, maybe we're close to getting that kind of heightened protection through the courts. Um, but so we talked right about immutability and born this way arguments work really well uh, for immutability. But that begs the question of, we don't have, where is born this way? We, we haven't gotten there yet. And so the born this way kind of thesis starts to come back into science. And I say back because there were pathological versions of born this way uh, long before uh, the 1950s and 1960s. But after that victory in 1973 at the APA, the gay rights movement has all of these allies in the sciences and increasingly so. And it is just at that moment that there are all sorts of innovations in the biological study of human behavior and identity. And that is, we get discoveries uh, about how to do more advanced DNA technology. We get uh, uh, a resurgence of uh, kind of testing on hormonal balances in queer people to discern maybe some bit of estrogen or or testosterone in utero is going to be affecting your brain and making you gay or straight. Um, and so there's all this money, there's all this new technology, the money's coming from the federal government's grants. It's also coming from private investors who are throwing everything at this new DNA and biotechnologies. And the runoff from that is going to, to, um, allow social scientists to, and natural scientists to start asking questions about maybe queer people are born that way. And so we get through the 70s, but especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, more research into the supposed biological nature of what it means to be queer. And that means you've got an even larger bench of experts to put in your pamphlets. Uh, there's a famous one from the 80s from this organization, PFLAG, called Why Is My Child Gay? It collects 12 or 13 of the key psychiatrists, sexologists of the era, most of them say something like, yeah, homosexuality is probably uh, genetic in origin or in utero in origin, but it's, it's definitely not something that you're uh, learning from your overbearing mother or your effeminate father or your abusive school teacher, right? It's becoming more and more uh, biological in nature. So those folks are really going to start contributing to all this new litigation, uh, trying to achieve, achieve strict scrutiny, but also trying to do things like 
uh, strike down sodomy bans, which are disproportionately uh, applied to queer people as well. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else on part one that you think that we should focus on before we move to part two? I think it's okay to move to part okay. two. And I, I also just want to footnote, like, it's amazing in the book, every time, and particularly in that chapter about uh, why is my child gay, to hear the same arguments that are being promoted today, you know, this in this language of of, uh, of grooming, et cetera, of, of, uh, almost as if it's a disease, queerness, that can be caught and prevented, and to sort of see this all having been discussed earlier and debunked. So, uh, okay, so part two is, you call it evolutions and adaptations, and uh, you start by focusing on this idea of a gay gene, which you've been sort of um, uh, foreshadowing here. So wh wh why, wh what happens with the hype of the gay gene and, and why does it affect this um, uh, quest for civil rights? Yeah, so in the late 1980s through the mid 1990s, Scholars will talk about this being an era of genomania, and that is, uh, this is an era when the federal government uh, and private investors are pursuing, uh, sometimes at odds with one another, an, a complete mapping of the human genomes called the Human Genome Project. And that eventually is going to yield massive amounts of data for folks to go in and probe and ask all kinds of questions about the genetic nature uh, of really complex human behaviors and characteristics. I mean, this is not, this. it's the era of genomania because these folks are not asking uh, always about whether you are susceptible to a particular kind of breast cancer and maybe a genomic analysis will help uh, us develop therapy or develop detection uh, methods for that. Uh, and it's not even just about genomics of something like height, for instance, but it's, really complex things like what it means to be queer. This is the era of the gay gene. Uh, notably, actually, also a booster of the Human Genome Project said that it's fine that the federal government is spending all of this money on mapping the human genome and not doing something like targeting uh, housing issues and homelessness, because actually the Human Genome Project will actually take care of that. Uh, this is the kind of techno utopianism i think we hear with artificial intelligence today too it's like that thing that's on the horizon that we're pouring all of our money into is going to change everyone's circumstances uh, radically for the better but the gay gene itself is something uh, that is going to be popularized by 1993 study by a geneticist called dean hammer who is going to not actually discover uh, a gene uh, for what it means to be gay. Uh, he would admit himself that what he found was a potential location on the X chromosome that might explain what it means to be gay, kind of mapping a path to an eventual understanding of the gen genetics of homosexuality. But this becomes sensational. Uh, Nightly News is bringing Dean Hammer and other researchers who are doing kind of parallel research on gay brains, for instance, uh, to talk on their programs. And the, the media, which is fully uh, in the throes of this genomania in general, is probing folks like Dean Hammer. Come on, just say it, basically. Like, you basically found a gay gene, or you've almost found a gay gene. And Dean Hammer uh, doesn't do everything in his power to disabuse people of that notion, I would say. And so the, the gay gene argument becomes something that becomes quite popular, uh, there are magazines at the time that say, I have a fetus on the cover that say, uh, this baby may have the gay gene. Will it be aborted? Uh, and so there's a fear about it too, but there's also an excitement about what the born this way argument can do. There's, it's both. It's extreme anxiety, but extreme hope about what this argument might be able to do. And that's why Dean Hammer and, and others end up being expert witnesses at the time in important civil rights uh, litigation, some of which goes all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And so in general, yeah, this is the period when 
gay and lesbian rights organizations are encountering all of this media, all of this scientific talk about gay genomics. And they're doing a lot to popularize that as well as to politicize and place it increasingly into their kind of arsenal of arguments for the struggle for equal rights. So in addition to the popularizing part of what's happening is uh, that you describe in the book is this sort of movement from a pathology to saying, and this is the name of one of your chapters, born perfect, like embracing it. Like, yes, I'm thrilled to have this gene. I'm thrilled to be this way and I'm going to celebrate it unabashedly. And I'm also going to assume that means that some other part of the U.S. Constitution applies to me, which is another part of the 14th Amendment that isn't that hard to uh, interpret, which says that you have equal protection of the law. So that doesn't require sex or sexual identity or gender identity to be listed in any way. All it says is that people have equal protection of the laws, which could mean how much sexual intimacy do they have? Can they marry? Can they adopt? So uh, take us through how it is we move from this pathology idea to this I'm born perfect ideal and how that then is part of the soup of trying to overturn marriage bans and, and also some you know other things that are out there like conversion therapy, et cetera. Yeah, so the marriage equality cases are really where we're going to see eventually a strong argument about immutability uttered by a Supreme Court justice. But to get there, we have to look back at the marriage uh, legal right kind of struggle begins in the 1990s. Uh, and in that period, there was really it's, it's a war over social scientific perspectives rather than biological ones on whether queer parents uh, make suitable uh, uh, kind of child rearers. Uh, and that is there's marriage equality cases are often being lost uh, when the kind of opponents of marriage equality can bring expert witnesses who say the children of queer couples do not fare very well. They have more kind of mental distress, anxiety. Uh, they may adopt the wrong gender identity. Uh, because of the lack of a strong male and female masculine feminine role models. And courts are convinced about this for a time at the lower kind of federal level. Uh, but then something starts to happen in the buildup to Obergefell, Obergefell v. Hodges uh, in 2015. And we start to see that script flip. And that is the gay rights litigators are having success with experts who can come and say, actually, that, that's all bunk. Queer uh, couples make excellent uh, parents. Uh, and, and when they don't, it's for the reasons that uh, other kinds of parents don't make excellent parents. It's about resources. It's about, you know, all sorts right. of stuff that have nothing to do with sexual orientation or your kind of gender identity or expression. Newsflash. Queer News people flash. are exactly the same <laughs> and they statistically look very similar when you look at the other characteristics of class race, education levels, geography, etc. Exactly. And we really see a parallel back to that Evelyn Hooker study in the 1950s, where she said, look, there are not increased rates of mental illness between homosexual and heterosexual people. And so it's this, this process uh, and this history is a constant debunking of those sorts of uh, ideas. Um, but also kind of in, if you read the legal briefs, the amicus briefs, uh, that uh, queer friendly and queer uh, rights organizations are filing in the cases that eventually go up and become Obergefell at the Supreme Court in 2015. They're saying all that stuff about parents, but they're also including long lists of all the biological studies on what it might mean to be gay. That's hormonal, they're neuroanatomical, they're genetic. And those briefs are read by or we can presume they were read by Justice Anthony Kennedy and his clerks. Kennedy eventually writes the opinion, making marriage equality the law of the land in Obergefell. And legal scholars uh, will talk about how confusing the jurisprudence uh, of this particular case is. Um, but what's really interesting is he says immutability a couple times. And he talks about how the kind of uh, uh, mental health experts of the day uh, and scientists have shown us 
that being gay is immutable. And he also connects it to the desire to be parents. So not only are queer people immutably so, they are immutably oriented toward being the head of nuclear families, right? Uh, He all but says that the white picket fence is encoded in queer people the same way it's encoded in heterosexual couples. This is really an argument that says to protect the uh, children of these queer couples, you have to let them be married because that's their natural trajectory. You screw that up, you screw up the whole social order. So actually granting rights to queer people is not going to destabilize the the kind of liberal, uh, pluralist, capitalist social order. Actually, it's going to maintain it. And, and, and we should note for those people who aren't uh, court nerds, that Anthony Kennedy is really not the person that you would expect to be making these arguments. He's appointed by Ronald Reagan. He's a registered Republican. He's quite a conservative juror, justice in his in his other cases. But there is something about animus towards queer people that gets to Justice Kennedy. And he combines that sensitivity about the discrimination with what you're aptly describing is not any sort of radical uh, uh, approach to social organizing. He's saying, hey, we need gay and lesbian people to be married with children, going to church, putting up fences and doing these things that average people do. So it is not a particularly um, uh, radical way of thinking. It's a very traditional way of him including gay and lesbian people in the model. However, the animus part I've always found to be sort of somewhat more interesting than the you should be married part because because everybody needs to be to be married in order to be a full contributing member of the society, uh, the kind of hard-baked traditionalism in the Kennedy approach. Okay, so we get that language, and what what does this what does this do to the way that activists are approaching getting more rights? Yeah, so for one, we can see that critics of the born this way idea, and that there are many critics of the born this way idea, and we could we could talk potentially about uh, more kind of left wing radical critiques of relying on scientific experts in general, and those have existed for about as long as the organized gay and lesbian movement uh, has existed. Uh, But one thing that Born This Way critics uh, were not quite right about was that the logic couldn't be adapted to trans rights. Uh, And you don't go back that long ago and you see scholars and activists say that, okay, maybe it'll work for gays, maybe it'll even work for lesbians, but it's not going to work for trans people. People just know that that's not, that can't be possibly inborn or it's not going to be convincingly portrayed as such. But actually, born this way arguments, uh, both in the kind of public sphere, we can think about Caitlyn Jenner talking about how painting her fingernails is related to the biology of her gender identity. Uh, And in the legal realm, we're going to see a huge reliance on biological studies of what it means to be trans. Uh, And it's going to look very similar to some of the gay and lesbian cases um, that we discussed. There are going to be rights restrictions. So uh, pretty much exactly after Obergefell gets handed down, Republican state lawmakers say, well, let's do bathroom bans. Let's discriminate against trans people now in a kind of en masse way. That'll be our new culture war kind of cleavage here. And uh, how litigators are going to challenge bathroom bans, they're going to bring neuroscientific experts, they're going to bring gender identity clinicians to court, and they're going to have them say things like, Actually, the brain scans of trans people look different than the brain scans of cisgender people. And to be fair to the gender identity clinicians, there are a lot of traditions in gender identity medicine that are not really wedded to a strong biological uh, idea of what it means to be trans. But you can see the litigators are pushing them to adopt the most born this way kind of argument they can possibly make. And all of that is premised on a really clever legal strategy, which says, okay, we have all sorts of statutory law, case law that says sex discrimination is illegal or unconstitutional. And so what if we could just convince courts that 
gender identity is sex itself. And so the argument here goes that there are all sorts of things that make up biological sex. There are chromosomes, gonads, genitals, secondary sex characteristics, like your skin texture, like your bone structure. But there's also another component, and that is your gender identity, which is located probably somewhere in the brain. And actually, that's not just one component, they say. It's the most important component. And so that is how these litigators really cleverly make, uh, in the absence of a lot of law that protects for gender identity, although that increasingly uh, at the local and state level does get codified. But in this kind of federal judicial approach, uh, where there is no kind of gender identity protections for trans people, it's a really clever legal maneuver that really works wonders. Uh, And federal judges are striking down bathroom bans, saying that actually this is an unconstitutional or illegal case of sex discrimination. Uh, and and yet yeah, the biology and the biological ish arguments are really central to those victories. And shockingly, you have one of the most conservative justices on the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch, appointed by Donald Trump, making a similar argument and saying, yes, the word sex, discrimination on the basis of sex, I think it also applies to trans people being discriminated against at work. That, again, like Kennedy, this is a very conservative justice, but on that one case was able to somehow make that connection. So it's fascinating. And I think a lot of what you're arguing, and I want to get to the conclusion before the end here, is that you're not positive about this. This this book is not a celebration of Uh, Well, no, let me take that back. The book is a celebration of the cleverness of the activists, and you acknowledge at every step the uphill battle that this was and the kind of cultural, socio-political waters that people were swimming in such that they were trying to win recognition for a minority group that had been treated as a pathological group of people who are a danger to society. And so they were willing to do these things, but you're not, every page of this book has a kind of caution to that strategy. So um, tell us a little bit more about why you think using this kind of science has potential dangers. Yeah, so this is very much bearing the lead to say at this point in the conversation that there's, regardless of everything we've talked about, there is not that compelling of evidence for the existence of something like a gay gene or gay genes. Uh, That's because we don't look for single candidate uh, genotype to phenotype relationships any longer in the field of genetics. And nor are there strong studies that really show that we know anything about the mechanisms in neuroscience that might cause someone to be trans in in a biological kind of way. Uh, The arguments are always political. They're always running ahead of the science. Um, And we've talked about the kind of reasons why they be kind of emerge and become compelling and even kind of legally and politically powerful. And that prompts me to say, for one, that I'm not making the argument that there is no role for scientific and medical expertise in the fight for civil rights. I say that because if you look at litigation uh, that is defending bans on so-called conversion therapies, uh, as well as a litigation uh, by queer advocates uh, against gender-affirming care, Uh, particularly for minors. These are two instances in which success does not depend on making an argument about who you are. And that might be kind of counterintuitive. But really, the only argument, and there's a lot of strong evidence for this, is you have to make is that conversion therapy practices are unscientific. They're harmful. They are are not in the realm of professional, legitimate uh, uh, mental health uh, care, and they have not been for a while. Uh, And we also know that gender affirming care practices are among the best practices for trans and gender expansive people. And all of those uh, arguments depend on scientific expertise uh, to defend against conservative attacks on on those projects. Um, But they don't at all rely 
on a strong argument about what it means to be gay or what it means to be trans. Uh, I say oftentimes that the, the, the argument here is you throw a lot of science that's pretty good to say that uh, when you hit someone and they tell you it hurts, you should believe them. That has nothing to do with uh, their kind of brain structures or their genetic codes. And those are arguments that are kind of much harder to defend. And I argue throughout the book, not necessary. And that is we've won all sorts of civil rights on the back of born this way arguments. Um, but that doesn't mean that they were the only ways to win those battles. And I think these other cases show us that there are other very powerful ways to make arguments that honestly look a lot like the homophile and lesbian arguments of the 50s and 60s, which were, we're not mentally ill. They weren't saying who we are. And so I think there's, there's some inspiration to be taken from that. I think the other reason why I am suspicious of Born This Way as a kind of political ideology is because it is fundamentally a liberal pluralist political ideology. It means that it has all sorts of great power for fighting for civil rights, and that is uh, when you go to lease an apartment, you shouldn't be discriminated against. When you're working your job, you shouldn't be discriminated against on the job or at the point of trying to get employment, et cetera, et cetera. But that the project ends there and that it benefits really the people who can afford the apartment lease. Uh, there's no protection for you if you're a queer person uh who cannot afford the apartment. That's not discrimination. That doesn't protect you. And making an argument that kind of coheres all gay and trans people, for instance, uh, as benefiting similarly from civil rights victories is a huge, huge error. Uh, and that actually born this way can really obfuscate the class differences uh, within those categories. Uh, and they can make them seem kind of apart. Whereas the vast majority of queer and trans people in this country are like the vast majority of people in this country. They are working class or poor and that their interests as such are more aligned than they are with, um, you know, a, a, a trans person who is working at McDonald's doesn't have a lot in common with the political interests of Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, and I should actually pick someone uh, who is still kind of on the liberal side of the aisle for that example. Um, but essentially saying, right, that the, the LGBTQ community as a concept is one that benefits a particular class skewed civil rights projects. And again, that has enormous benefits uh, for for all sorts of folks, um, but it's class skewed and it benefits you again if you can afford the apartment uh, 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 and, and doesn't do a lot if you need health insurance. No, and I think the book does an excellent job of showing how look, the liberal project uh, is not fully realized in the text of the U.S. Constitution, right? or it is, but it wasn't uh, intended as such at the moment of its founding. And given the emphasis uh, of the majority of the Supreme Court on what was the original meaning, well, the original meaning was not to include almost all people in the United States as part of the equal citizens who would afford any of these things. So there's sort of two parts. On the, and, the, and the one part is the one that has been, I think, pushed by uh, civil rights activists, which is how do we get the U.S. Constitution to include us in what they offer? And then the second part is, well, but what they offer might actually not be what we need. So it's it's this kind of success-ish on part of it, but then ultimately perhaps stopping us from asking the questions about, well, does everybody want to be married? Is marriage actually the institution that everybody should run to in order to have recognition? Or should we be allowed to not be married and still be given a certain kind of respect and um, inequality. Well, this is an amazing book. We have skimmed the surface. You have incredible examples. This is beautifully researched and uh, really accessible. And I, I want to say to the people listening, this is a book that can be assigned in its whole. It's also a book in which chapters can be taken and accessed by uh, you know 
anybody who just wants to read a good book, but also by undergraduates and graduate students. Um, Joanna, before we say goodbye, is there anything we haven't covered that is really important to you? And I know you just finished this book and you should be basking in that good glow, but it, can you tell us about what's next uh, on the research agenda for you? Yeah. So I'm in my most recent work, uh, I've been sticking with the theme of scientific and medical expertise in queer rights. And with my co-author, uh, Brianna S. Last, who is a professor of clinical psychology, we've paired together uh, on a study that was just published in Social Science and Medicine that looked at what we called agents of scientific uncertainty who conjure doubt uh, about gender affirming care's safety and efficacy. So these are all the kind of dark money funded organizations, the Christian conservative legal organizations, and the fringe medical experts who all kind of come together to say, actually, gender affirming care is something dangerously experimental uh, and thus deserves legal prohibition. And what we did is we mapped that entire kind of network uh, and we talked about kind of how to reckon with the inherent uncertainty in something like gender affirming care. And there is uncertainty, but it's not the kind of uncertainty that's being conjured and exploited in a political uh, and also legal way uh, to kind of revoke access to gender affirming care uh, for minors, but potentially adults in the near future. So this is something that I'm kind of expanding on in the future, really mapping not just the scientific experts on the right uh, these days, but also uh, the kind of uh, political economic factors and, and, and donors that kind of cohere that project together more in the shadows. We will link to that article, a co-authored article in the show notes. Joanna, Thank you so much for writing the book. I really enjoyed reading it and coming to have this conversation today. And best of luck at starting your new job at Stony Brook. Your students and colleagues are going to be very, very lucky. Thanks so much, Susan. <laughs>